Today I'm out in Sedona, Arizona driving the new fourth generation Honda Pilot. With the previous generation, Honda realized that they had strayed a bit far from the formula that had made the previous generation Pilots such a success. So for this generation, they've returned to the boxy styling, they've added in some extra off-road capability, and then they've made this the biggest and most powerful Pilot ever. By this point, you've probably all seen pictures of the new Pilot, so let's just run through the styling very, very briefly. Obviously, bigger and boxier is the theme for this generation. We have a taller hood, we have a blunter front end, and the latest version of Honda's truck front end that we probably will see in upcoming generations of the Passport and the Ridgeline in the future. Full LED headlights there. Down at the bottom of the bumper, we have teeny tiny little LED fog lights down there as well. And Honda says that the front overhang has been shortened a little bit. The front end styling isn't just boxier, the hood's also longer, giving this a bit more of a rear wheel drive proportion, which is decidedly attractive. At 199.9 inches long, this is three and a half inches longer than the outgoing model, and the wheelbase has also been stretched to improve second row and third row legroom. The box has also become a little bit bigger. It's taller, about an inch taller than before, and it's higher off the ground, 8.3 inches in the new Trail Sport model, 7.3 inches of ground clearance in the rest of the lineup. They've also tweaked the rear end styling to be a little bit different than the outgoing model with this body painted pillar right there and a bit more of a trapezoidal window in the rear. Let me know what you think of the look in the comment section. To my eye, this gives me a little bit of a Dodge Durango vibe, oddly enough, from some angles. It's worth noting that the roof rails are standard on most models, but not if you get the new LX trim. The existence of the LX trim is a big deal, because when I first saw the Pilot in the studio, the Sport trim was going to be the base model, and that was nearly $40,000. The LX trim, priced at $35,950, is much more in line with the bulk of the base competition, but you do lose out on a few features. Most notably, it deletes the heated seats, power seats, leather steering wheel, smart entry, fog lights, roof rails, and blind spot monitoring that you find on the Sport trim. Also, of course, the LX starts as front wheel drive, but you will be able to choose all wheel drive if you're interested. Getting back to the styling, the rear end is certainly more chiseled than before, including the tail lamps, which I find particularly attractive, with the exception of the incandescent turn signal. That bums me out a bit because this is the top end Elite trim, over $50,000, and you do find standard LED turn signals in some of the competition. Pilot is spelled out nice and large across the rear with this black bar that really makes it look wider. And it is indeed wider than the outgoing model. The track especially is about an inch and a half wider. That's the distance between the wheels. Down at the bottom of the bumper, we have chrome ovals or rectangles, whatever you'd call that. But these are not exhaust tips. Those are actually tucked up under the bumper. Under the hood, we find an all new dual overhead cam 3.5 liter V6. There has been some confusion around this engine and whether it is in fact new. Here's the deal. J is the engine series, 35 is the displacement. So of course this is a J35 engine just like the previous one, but it has a different head, a different block, and completely different internals as well. Previous engine was single overhead cam. This is dual overhead cam with infinitely variable valve timing, variable cylinder management, and it's mated to a new 10-speed automatic transmission. Power comes in at 285 horsepower, torque at 262 pound-feet of torque, and fuel economy will range between 22 miles per gallon for the most efficient front-wheel drive model, 20 miles per gallon if you get the Trail Sport. This Elite splits the difference at 21 miles per gallon combined. All models are rated to tow either 3,500 pounds as a front-wheel drive vehicle or 5,000 pounds when equipped with all-wheel drive, and no additional cooler is needed for the max tow ability. Previously, you had to add an extra cooler to the vehicle in order to tow 5,000 pounds. Now that's included right from the factory. Now that Toyota has moved to a 2.4 liter turbo in the Highlander, I suspect some Highlander shoppers might want to jump ship to the Pilot because this still uses that naturally aspirated V6 that so many shoppers are still looking for. If you want the most rugged version of the most rugged generation of Pilot, you want the new Trail Sport trim. This takes the previous Trail Sport formula and dials it up a bit for 2023. We of course get the blacked out accents and slightly revised styling that we've seen in Trail Sport models before, but there's some more substantive changes going on under the skin. First up, we have skid plates, front and back, protecting the engine, transmission, and fuel tank. But oddly enough, no skid plate over the rear differential. The tires go from 255 with road focus tires to 265 60R18s with a more aggressive all-terrain style rubber on them. We also get a full-size spare tire in the back and an extra inch of ground clearance. But at 8.3 inches, this is not as high as some of the competition. This is certainly higher than average, however. 
The taillights remain essentially the same, but the rear bumper changes a bit to improve the departure angle and accommodate that full-size spare tire in the back. We have a tow hitch receiver right there that acts as a recovery point in the back. There's also a recovery point up front under the rear bumper, so a little bit different than some off-road vehicles. We have a revised suspension design, of course, because of that extra inch of ground clearance, but also for some of the off-roading realities. So this tends to be a little bit softer than the rest of the lineup. We also get new camera angles for this vehicle, and most importantly, different all-wheel drive programming. This can now send 50% more torque to the rear than the 2022 Trail Sport model, and even 25% more torque to the rear axle versus the regular base version of the 2023 Pilot. One consideration with the Trail Sport model, if you do plan on taking your vehicle actually off-roading, is the location of the recovery points. You'll notice we don't have anything up front in the front bumper. Honda says that was for pedestrian safety considerations, so the only recovery point is part of the skid plate underneath the vehicle. Now, you'll notice that this is pretty muddy, and right now that recovery point is not only muddy, it's pretty far under there. So if you get yourself stuck in deep mud, you'll have to fish around underneath the vehicle to find that recovery point and recover. You could use the hitch in the back of the vehicle that is designed as a recovery point as well and rated for twice the GVWR of the pilot, but there are gonna be situations where you can only recover going forwards, not going backwards, so that may not work. This is what the skid plates look like underneath the Pilot. They're just about as thick as you'd expect in any off-road designed vehicle. And this is the recovery point at the very front of the skid plate. It's been reinforced, so it is pretty thick at this point. It's at least a quarter inch thick of steel. So that's the recovery point up front, but it again is pretty decently behind the front bumper. Honda has revised the front seat design to make this more comfortable on longer road trips. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to spend more than a few hours in the vehicle, but it did appear pretty comfortable for that time. On the downside, even this top end elite trim with the two position memory only has a two way adjustable lumbar support. I would really love to see four way lumbar in the top trim because you will find that in some of the competition. The tilt telescopic steering column is manual, but it has a large range of motion. One thing worth noting as well is that even in this top end elite trim, front passenger seat does not have the same range of motion as the driver's seat and it lacks any kind of lumbar adjustability. Jumping into the back seat, we definitely find nice tall door openings, making it easier to get in and out of the vehicle, especially for people with mobility issues. We also find lots of legroom and second row seats that slide forward and backward. But you will notice that combined legroom is higher in the Korean Twins. Those are about 117 inches of combined legroom. We have a little bit less here in the Pilot. Lots of handy storage slots, storage slots for your smartphone, tablet computers, things like that, and even a small storage slot right there at the top of the rear seat. One of the most interesting twists, however, about the Pilot is this top-end Elite trim that is still eight passengers and has the panoramic moonroof. This is the only option in this segment to retain eight seats and the big opening pano moonroof. Scooting all the way over to this side, the front seat's all the way back its tracks. You can see I still have a lot of room left. Now, what's interesting about this eight seat arrangement is that it's your choice of seven or eight seats because I can fold down this center seat position independently, have some cup holders and an armrest, or I can pull an additional little lever here and then pull this completely out of the vehicle and store it wherever you might want to, including, of course, the cargo area. The second row footwell is completely flat. We have three zone climate control in this model, but you'll notice that when the middle seat is removed, the latches are still available. I'm surprised that there isn't something that snaps on or locks into place over that area because these strike me as trip hazards, especially for children with tiny feet. They could get caught in there, so certainly keep that in mind. Now let's check out the third row together. Hopping into the back is pretty easy. Again, as long as you don't have a child seat in there. Let's slide that all the way back and back into place. I have quite a lot of leg room. I'll move this seat so that way you can see how much room is going on back here. I have about an inch and a half, two inches of leg room with this second row seat slid all the way back and in its most upright position. But more impressive than that is the headroom in the third row. And this is what the pilot has been known for in previous generations. It's finally back. We have gobs of headroom back here. I have about an inch and a half in the rear. If you want more headroom than this, Basically, minivans are the only option for third rows because you won't find more room in a Suburban or a Wagoneer or something like that. But those vehicles will have a wider third row. This has a really, really tight middle seat. And here you can probably see this somewhat annoying shoulder belt from the second row. That's just gonna be a reality if you're using all of the seats in the vehicle. All the shoulder belts for the center section come out of the ceiling. That's definitely not my preference. There is an additional set of latch anchors over on the passenger side in the third row. And as you can see, really couldn't put three of me back here as far as width, 
but as far as height, you could certainly put two of me back here and be pretty comfortable. The third row seats also have a bit of a recline to them. You can recline them a bit more. At this point, my hair is just barely brushing this center shoulder belt mount that's kind of coming out there. But I do have air vents back here, cup holders, and the seat, although it is on the low side, is not quite as slammed to the floor as um. Since three row crossovers are really the minivans of the 21st century, enlarging the cargo capacity was a huge priority for Honda. And boy, did they ever. We get 22.4 cubic feet of cargo space back here before you count the extra 1.8 cubic feet of cargo space under the load floor. Behind the second row seats, that balloons out to 60.1 cubic feet, 114.3 behind the first row seats. That compares incredibly favorably with some of the larger entries that this is competing with, like the Telluride and the Palisade. The Telluride, just 21 cubic feet back here, and that's including its underfloor storage, and then about 50 cubic feet behind the second row. So you can see this is definitely more accommodating. Now, one thing I don't know is the dimension between this side and this side of the cargo area as to whether you'd be able to get four by sheet goods in here. Hopefully I'll be able to measure that at some point soon. You might have to wait till I get one of these back at home. I would hope that it is, but it does appear just a little bit narrower. You'll notice that the interior really widens out after the hatch. The hatch is a little bit tighter on the rear. If you want more storage room, of course, there is that under floor storage area and it is positively huge. You can drop an entire 22 inch roller bag in there, put some additional cargo on top, and still close the lid. The storage area is so large because of this removable second row middle seat. You can take it out of the vehicle and then store it right in the vehicle if you want to. Now this seat is not as light as I would like. It's probably about 35 or 40 pounds or so, something along those lines, but you have to remove this from the vehicle. There's no hinge there to keep it in place. You can actually just drop this right there in the cargo well. There we go, nudge it right into the right space, and then put the floor right back on top. And if you're worried about it flying around or rattling in the back, there is a safety strap to latch it in place. This has to be one of the coolest features available in a vehicle for 2023, but there is a problem. You'll only find it in the top trims. The rest of the lineup, it's either seven or eight passenger only, no removable middle seat. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in the top end elite trim, which of course has this large dual pane panoramic moonroof. When you open the moonroof, the glass goes down on the inside and then slides rearward, which is kind of an interesting twist. It doesn't stick up. So anything on those load bars on the roof, it's not going to interfere with. We have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger, height adjustable headrests as well. And from this angle, you can see how much room Brian has way back there in the rear. The upholstery is obviously going to change as you move from model to model. EXL is where leather upholstery starts. We get unique upholstery in this elite trim. The seats are perforated because these are both heated and ventilated. And I really like the color combination in here. The charcoal accents with the sort of dark chestnut brown leather. We also have dark chestnut going over on the doors. See that combination of charcoal and then the dark chestnut down there as well. We have lots of storage cubbies on the door, cup holders, bottle holders, knickknack holders there, and that large storage bin at the bottom. As you'd expect, all of that is made from hard plastic to help improve durability. But then we have soft plastics where you'd rest your arm, armrest there, that insert in the middle, and then some sort of rubbery textures going on on the top. That matches what's going on on the dashboard. We have the return of this storage bin right here in the dash. It's definitely big enough to store larger smartphones. Missed opportunity would be a wireless charging mat in there. I would love to see someone do that. We don't find that in the competition, but it would be cool to see at some point. We have a big bin style glove compartment down here. You'd have no problem fitting an 11 inch tablet computer inside. Again, that soft touch dashboard component. And here in the middle of the dashboard, we find the biggest LCD available in the pilot. I think this is a bit of a misstep for Honda. This is considerably smaller than the new big screen that we find in the Honda Accord, which I will be driving next month. This is also on the small side for this entire segment. Pretty much all the new entries have at least 12 inch screens. If you get the rest of the lineup, then you'll actually get a slightly smaller LCD. It of course features smartphone integration, wireless in this model. And then the software interface is what we've seen from Honda for a while in some of their other models. It is not the newest system that you'll also find in the top end Honda Accord. The way that this system is integrated into the dashboard, it looks like it could be upgraded to some larger format screen in the future. Hopefully that comes at some later date. Moving down from there, we have the controls for the Tri-Zone Automatic Climate Control. Physical buttons, no touch buttons here. So if you're not a fan of those, you won't find them here. Below that, we find a small storage cubby there. You could keep the vehicle's key. 
USB input for the system, USB charge only port, 12 volt power port, Qi wireless charging mat. One thing to note on this char charging mat is that it uh, does appear to be able to charge phones through thicker cases. So that's not a problem there at all. Down from there, we have the Hunt and Peck shifter arrangement that we've seen from Honda for a while. Drive is there, reverse is that button there, neutral and then park. Drive mode toggle, auto start stop, enable disable. It's the hill descent control button right there. Auto brake hold and an electric parking brake. From this angle, you can really see how wide the interior of the Pilot is. It has definitely grown over time. So now we have the shifter controls and those big cup holders there. And then this wide center armrest with a large storage compartment inside. One thing that surprised me is that there is no under center console storage area. And some of the competitors will allow you to put decently sized bags right there under the center console. Moving over to the dashboard, we have a color heads up display. You can see the opening right there and then you can see the display right above it. The display is on the small side for a modern heads-up display, but pretty in keeping with most of the mainstream competition. Just below that, we have a just over 10-inch LCD instrument cluster. Likely because of the design of the bezel, this display also appears a little on the small side. We get LED gauges for the engine temperature and the fuel level. Then we get a digital tachometer and digital speedometer on the inside. The display is customizable via the controls on the steering wheel. The two basic display types were the bar style that you saw before and the round gauge that you see now. You can get information on the inside of each of these dials like turn by turn navigation directions and of course the status of the vehicle's active safety software. Moving out from there you can see that that display does appear a little on the small side compared to some of the competitors with 12 inch LCDs. We have shift paddles on the back of the steering wheel, nice clean steering wheel design, large central spoke down there at the bottom that's where you find the heated steering wheel button. You'll find the controls for the adaptive cruise control over here on this side the infotainment system over here on this side. The two rotary controls control the various sides of that LCD instrument cluster. So you rotate that one around for those various audio options. You rotate this one around for the options inside of that speedometer. The defining feature of the new Pilot out on the road has to be the new 10-speed automatic transmission, which was an in-house design by Honda and is absolutely fantastic. The 9-speed in the previous generation Pilot that was made by ZF of Germany and is used in a number of other Acura and Chrysler and Land Rover vehicles, etc., has been pretty controversial because it does not feel like most automatic transmissions. Some shifts take a little bit longer than others, and that results in kind of a peculiar feel, especially when downshifting. The Pilot now does not have that feeling at all. You floor it, it shifts, away you go. It doesn't matter what gear you're in, what gear you're going to, everything feels just as you'd expect. The other thing that's noteworthy about this transmission is that first gear is extremely low. So even though I'm out here over 5,000 feet in elevation, if I floor it, launches are actually pretty peppy. And this shoots off the gears just like a machine gun. They're very fast and very crisp. I don't have an official zero to 60 time just yet because clearly I'm testing this at 5,000 feet above normal but I suspect this is gonna be just below seven seconds, zero to 60. This is likely going to be one of the fastest in this segment as far as acceleration goes. Now, as far as six to zero stopping distance goes, this is probably gonna be in line with most of the competition based on the curb weight, the tire size, etc. Most models will have 255 with tires like this Elite trim that I'm driving out on the road right now. Expect slightly longer stopping distances in the Trail Sport because of the all-terrain tires that that model has on it. Even though they are slightly wider, it's probably going to take a little bit longer to stop because of the tires on board. If you're looking for the sharpest handling entry in this segment or the most fun to drive, that would still be something along the lines of the Mazda CX-9 or likely, of course, the upcoming Mazda CX-90, which is going to be an awful lot of fun, rear-wheel drive, inline six engine, that should be fantastic. But the Pilot does really well for itself. Thanks to the torque vectoring axle in the back on the all-wheel drive models, this is an awful lot of fun when the road starts to wind. But it's not tuned towards the firmer side of things. The ride is definitely pretty average for a three-row crossover. It soaks up the small bumps and the big bumps really nicely. There is a little bit of body roll in the corners. You'll definitely notice some tip and dive, just as you'd expect out of a vehicle that's tuned for highway duty, and of course for carting the family around in the back. But when the road starts to bend, you can have a reasonable amount of fun in here. Whether you want to call this IVTM or super handling all-wheel drive, which is what Acura calls this exact same system, I'll leave that up to you. I actually think the SHAWD moniker is actually a little bit more fun. Either way, this system is fantastic, not just because of its off-road ability, which we'll get to in a moment, but because of its torque vectoring ability when you're driving out on roads like this. It really gives this the feel of more of a rear power biased all-wheel drive system or a rear-wheel drive vehicle at times. Now, that's only going to help you as far as handling power on. Neutral handling is basically going to be the same as any other model. 
Fortunately, we've stumbled upon this gravel road. It's a perfect place to talk about the ride quality. This is definitely softer than some of the more performance oriented vehicles, but this is not going to be as soft as an air suspension equipped Jeep Grand Cherokee. Obviously, that air suspension equipped Jeep is going to be a lot more expensive than this, so keep that comparison in mind. As far as the suspension tuning for this kind of road surface goes, it is very, very similar to something like a Telluride or a Highlander. But the Trail Sport model is a little bit softer, so if you find yourself on rougher roads, even if you don't need the extra off-road ability, you might want to take a look at the Trail Sport model because it is going to be a little bit more comfortable. Speaking of the Trail Sport model, let's talk about the off-road ability of the Pilot. Thanks to the torque vectoring axle in the rear, which can also function as a limited slip differential, capability is notably higher than the off-road formats of basically almost all the competition outside of a Jeep or a Land Rover or something along those lines. This is certainly going to be more capable intrinsically as far as the core capabilities of the mechanical all-wheel drive system than a Palisade or a Telluride or something along those lines. And there is no off-road version of the Highlander at this point in time, although its all-wheel drive system in the top end trims thematically is not far off what we see here. If you want to take things to the next level and you want a two-speed transfer case, you want a true locking differential in the rear, you're going to have to opt for something like the Jeep Grand Cherokee. But this will get you much further off the beaten path than basically all of the competition. And that competition really would include the Subarus that you might want to cross shop against the Pilot. Subaru does a really good job when it comes to all-wheel drive software tuning, but the core hardware in the system is not able to send as much power to the rear as this, and there's no limited slip functionality mechanically in a Subaru all-wheel drive system. So this can send more power to the rear axle and more power to a single rear wheel than any Subaru that is currently sold in North America. Earlier in the day, I had the opportunity to spend some time with the Trail Sport model out on trails, and you can definitely see that this is very capable as far as a mainstream three-row crossover goes, but there are a few caveats that you should know about. The front overhang is still relatively long as far as a three-row off-road vehicle would go, so something like a three-row Grand Cherokee or a three-row Land Rover Defender. Again, qualifying this that those are very expensive vehicles, so this is not in the same category, they will get you further off that beaten path. The approach and departure angles are going to be better, they have more ground clearance, and they have a lot more wheel articulation. If you get the Pilot in off-camber situations, you'll notice it's an awful lot easier to get one wheel up in the air. So it's fortunate that the traction control situation can deal with that, but it is much less likely to get one wheel up in the air in a vehicle with a lot more suspension articulation. Honda chose not to go that route because it's much more complicated, much more expensive, and there are just too many on-road compromises. You'd need things like disconnecting sway bars, you'd need an air suspension, uh, you would need to have your independent suspension designed very differently to accommodate that kind of articulation, and all of that is going to increase unreliability, it's going to increase costs, etc. It's just not rational for an occasional use off-road vehicle like the Trail Sport is really trying to be. Back out on the paved road, cabin noise is well controlled, something that the previous pilot struggled with a little bit depending on the trim level. Keep in mind we have 255 width tires in all models except for the Trail Sport, so the cabin noise figure is pretty impressive since these are relatively wide tires. I don't have official cabin noise scores just yet, but I suspect this is probably going to be somewhere around 71 decibels, so obviously a little bit louder than a luxury crossover would be, but right in line with most of the competition, or I should say, most of the quieter competition. As far as fuel economy goes, we've been averaging 20 miles per gallon over a day of mixed driving. That's a little bit below what the EPA says we should be getting, but that's to be expected because of the altitude and the kind of driving that we've been doing. I wouldn't be surprised if this overperformed out on the highway thanks to the cylinder deactivation system as long as you kept speeds reasonable, but will likely underperform the EPA numbers in the city. If you want something that's quiet and competent and definitely peppy, you want to take a look at the Pilot. The extra gear ratios, especially the aggressive first gear ratio, gets this off the line much faster than the Highlander or the Telluride or the Palisade, and the transmission comes across as a lot smoother than what we find in the Pathfinder. Now, if you want the smoothest transmission in the segment, I think that still would be the 8-speed ZF transmission that we find in the Grand Cherokee, but that's going to cost you an awful lot more than this, and it's not really going to be any faster if we're talking about most of the versions. Bear in mind that you'll only find the 5.7 liter V8 for 2023 in the three-row model, and only in the most expensive format of the three-row model, and those can be twenty, even $30,000 more expensive than the Pilot. The V6 versions, they're probably going to be slower than this because they are an awful lot heavier. 
looking to get your hands on the new Pilot, you're in luck. It's already on sale, and it's going to start at $35,950 for that LX trim that I talked about earlier. The Sport trim, which I think is more of a realistic base model, that's going to be $39,150. And I suspect the bulk of sales will be the slightly more expensive EXL trim. That's the first model with leather upholstery. If you want the more off-road capable version, that's going to be the Trail Sport at $48,350. As you can see, pricing starts to ramp up pretty quickly there. But it is a lot less expensive than a comparably capable off-road version of a Jeep Grand Cherokee. This Elite trim is logically the most expensive at $52,030. Plus, of course, a $1,395 destination charge on every new pilot. If you want some of the features available on the Elite trim, but you want a slightly lower price tag, you could get the Touring trim for $46,450. That gives you the option of all-wheel drive. It is standard on the Elite trim, so you could save a little bit of money, get slightly better fuel economy, and have most of the feature set that we find on this model. But a number of things are exclusive to the Elite trim, like that full LCD instrument cluster, which is on the small side, but it is still a full LCD. And another interesting twist with the Pilot pricing lineup is that if you get the EXL trim, you have the option to either get eight passenger seating or you can get captain's chairs, but you do not have the removable seat in the middle of the second row. Instead, it's fixed in place. The removable seat in the middle is a really unique feature to the Pilot, but it only occurs in the top end trims. So keep that in mind. You get the choice of seven passenger or eight passenger seating in the rest of the lineup. If you want the ability to choose on the fly between seven or eight passengers, you have to get the top end trims only. And that excludes the Trail Sport, which is seven seat, period. If you weren't the biggest fan of the third generation Pilot, this fourth generation might change your mind. It certainly looks a lot more rugged, a lot more capable, and is of course indeed more capable than the third generation Pilot. But more importantly than that, it's absolutely enormous on the inside. It doesn't have as much leg room as we find in the Korean Twins, but it does have a more accommodating third row. In fact, the third row is a reason all on its own to buy the new Pilot. We have more headroom back there than you'll find in any full-size SUV in America. If you have taller people that need to sit in the third row, forget the Suburban, forget the Wagoneer, get the Pilot instead. And that's largely what the second generation Pilot sold on, to be perfectly honest. I know tons of people that bought it simply because of that third row. But it also has a large amount of cargo capacity. Over 21 cubic feet back here, a lot of cargo capacity behind the second row, and even more behind the first row. If you need more cargo space in your next generation three row, then you're gonna to need to take a look at something like a Honda Odyssey. It will have a slightly larger opening than this Pilot. I'm not sure whether you could fit four by sheet goods back here. It'll be a little close, but on the inside, it is definitely very, very wide. It's just the opening that's a little bit smaller. It also has a great engine exhaust note, of course, that 10-speed automatic transmission is smoother than the 9-speeds we find in some of the competition, and I love the practicality of that easily removable 8th seat if you get the Elite trim. Now, there are a few things I'm disappointed in. The removable 8th seat, it's not included in every 8-seat model. It's only in the top-end trims. And there is a weird version of the EXL that is just 7-seat only because it doesn't have that removable middle seat. I kind of wish they had just stuck that on as an option in that model. Also, the LCDs on the inside are a little small and feel a little bit old, even though this is brand new. It does not have the newest software in the Honda lineup. You'll find that in the next generation Honda Accord with its 12-inch screen and the dashboard. This is smaller by far than what we find in the Toyota Highlander with its 14-inch LCD and its 12-inch LCD instrument cluster, or in the Korean Twins with their twin 12-inch LCDs. So if you love LCDs, you probably are not going to want to get this. You're going to want to get one of those other options. Also, no hybrid system is available. I wish that was an option in this. Unfortunately, you may have to wait till the fifth generation Pilot for that option to occur. But bottom line, the Pilot is an extremely compelling option in this segment. If you're interested in a large and accommodating interior, more rugged ability than you'll find in the vast majority of the competition, and competent driving dynamics as well. Be sure to let me know what you think about that in the comments section. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already done so, and stay tuned because hopefully I'll have this at home to run it through our usual battery of comparisons, tests, child seat tests, luggage tests, etc. just as soon as I possibly can. See all of you later.